just had a sample of what heaven's going to be like. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You see, one of the things that's so crazy about our church that we get comments about a lot is how unique we are, how welcome when we are, but also how diverse we are. And that's one of the things that I love to celebrate our, about our church, too, is how diverse we are. Because, you see, that's what heaven's going to be like. Heaven is going to be a diverse place. There's going to be all generations. Some of you thought, oh, you know, I thought when I got a new body, I was going to get a young one. <laughs> Didn't say a young one, it just said a new one, okay? So, you see, there's going to be multi-generations in heaven. Because God wants all people, all generations, all races worshiping Him. Amen? And you so see, one of the things that's so awesome about our church is we already have that. Amen? Amen. We already have that. And so every morning when we get together to worship on a Sunday, we are celebrating a little bit of heaven. And to me, that is awesome. Well, today we're starting a new series called Advancers. And yes, <laughs> because I just can't get away from the Marvel Cinematic Universe, right? And I have not seen it yet, so I won't be giving any spoilers because I don't know. Um, yes. <laughs> but, but you see, the thing about it for me is, it's like, what happened after Jesus resurrected from the dead? Did we not have a great service last week? It was awesome. Praise God, you know, for that. And... Um, and so, you know, here we are the, the, the week after, you know, and in and, and a lot of places, you know, the attendance is back to normal. Um, but, but the church doesn't have to be back to normal. And, and so one of the things that's so awesome about resurrection is that there's always hope. There's always new life. There's always growth. And I want to encourage you that if you invited someone to be with you on Easter, that you invite them back, Okay. Invite them to come on a day that's other than Easter or a holiday, all right? And, and encourage them to come and worship with you. Because everybody loves an event. But you know, as Darren has already said, every day should be Resurrection Day for a Christian. Every day we get to celebrate new life. Every day we can have a relationship with Christ that brings us hope and joy. Unfortunately... There are a lot of churches around the, the globe, and in the U.S. in particular, that are closing rapidly. Now, we are not going to be one of those churches. Amen? We are not going to be one of those churches. But I want you to see some of these statistics. Every year, more than 4,000 churches close their doors compared to just over 1,000 new church starts. That means they are closing rapidly. Every week, churches are closing. Why is this? I mean, look at this statistic. Half of all churches in the U.S. did not add any new members to their ranks in the last two years. But praise God, we had five baptisms last week. Amen. You see, we're not going to be one of those churches. Our church is going to advance. Amen. Look at this. The United States now ranks third among uh, following China and India in the number of people who are not professing Christians. In other words, the U.S. is becoming an ever-increasing unreached people group. Did you know this, that there are actually countries that are sending missionaries to the U.S. because we are no longer a Christian nation? It's crazy to think about. But I've heard this, that there are people from Africa who are coming here to evangelize America. There are people from Korea who are coming here to evangelize people in America. It's because the Christians in America are not doing it. It's because we are not advancing the gospel. But God's gospel is going to be advanced, whether we do it or not. God is going to advance His kingdom. Every year, two and a half million church members fail, fall into inactivity. This translate into the, tra translates into the realization that people are leaving the church. From the research done, we have found that they are leaving as hurting and wounded victims of some kind of abuse, disillusionment, or just plain neglect. Now think about that. Church should be a place where hurting people come but it should not be a place where people get hurt. We need to make sure that we are taking care of one another. 
that we are loving one another. Because listen, if we do not love one another, what difference are we than the people who are not in church? People look to the church to be an example. And yet, we are far often an example of what not to do. Of how people don't love. Of how people don't care. One of, the, one of the things that I was talking about yesterday with someone is, you know, I don't ever want our church to be a place where a visitor or a guest comes and they don't feel welcome. I don't ever want that. You know why? Because I felt that before. I've been in situations like that before where I've come to a, a, an organization, a Christian organization, and I just stood there and nobody ever came up to me. Nobody ever welcomed me. Nobody ever said, hey, glad, glad, to be, glad that you're here. And you know what? I didn't want to go back. <laughs> but, but listen to this Because I was a stronger Christian I did go back But everybody's not going to do that So you know what I did? I went back to that organization And I became part of the leadership And started changing that organization Because I was like We're not going to have this We're not going to have this And so I made it my goal Every time there was a guest coming in I made sure I was reaching out to them I became the coordinator I became the missions uh, coordinator. So it's like, look, if you don't like something in this church, that's okay. But you need to be part of the change. Okay? Because it's not just my job. If you remember, those, many of you may, were not here whenever I first took over, but, or I don't want to say took over. I didn't take over. <laughs> I did not take over. Okay? Many of you were not here when I was first drafted into <laughs> this role. But if you remember, those of you who were here, I said, this is not going to be a me, this is going to be a we. Right? And, and we have to have all of us doing our jobs. All of us reaching out to people. Because look, I can't, and, and look, I, I'm a single guy, I've got time, I've got tons of time. I try to use my time wisely. But I can't do it all. And I know that some of you may not have as much time as I have, but you got some time. And there's probably some things you could cut out that you don't need to be doing that, that's, that, that could use your time a little better. Okay? And, and so I just want to say that if our church is really going to be all that we want it to be, and there's nobody in this church who wouldn't say, oh, I don't want this church to grow, then why are you here? You see, we want this church to grow. But if we want it to grow, it's going to take more than a want. It's going to take an investment of your time, of your gifts, of your abilities. It's going to take a sacrifice. It's going to take you giving maybe more than what you've been giving. You think about the advancers of the gospel. Look at this. We see the figures drop to 15% of Americans in attendance at church by 2025 a further drop to 11 or 12% in 2050. Churches are declining. I don't want to be a statistic of a church in decline. Things are going great here. God is blessing us, and we are, we are moving and we are growing. But you know what? Anybody can do that for a short time. But I don't, I, look, I, I want long-term I want long-term growth. I want long-term. You want to see a good return on your investment, don't you? You would think after several years, right, of you investing some money, of you investing yourself, right, for your retirement, you want to see a big return. I want to see a big return at the end of our time. But the only way we're going to have that in heaven, right, is we've got to continually invest and make good moves. And part of making good move is us moving together. We've got to move together, right? We move together. So this morning, I want to share this passage with you, actually several passages that we're going to look at here. This happens right after Jesus rises from the dead. Uh, this is written by Luke, Dr. Luke, if you didn't know that. Luke was a doctor, and he wrote the gospel of Luke. Acts is a continuation of his gospel. Uh, but it's called Acts because of the acts of the church, the things that the church did or that the disciples did right after Jesus rose from the dead. And so he's writing this to a, a gentleman named Theophilus. 
Now, Theophilus is, is interesting because uh, Theo, we know, means God. Okay? So he's writing to a, a guy who's named after a God. And he says, The first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven after he had been uh, by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. To these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which, he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit uh, not many days from now. So when they had come together, they were asking him, Lord, is it, time, is it at this time you're restoring the kingdom to Israel? That's a good question. You see, Jesus had come and they knew, they knew he was the Messiah. At least they thought he was the Messiah, but they thought he was going to bring in the kingdom right then and there. So then Jesus dies, but then he comes back to life. And they're thinking, oh, okay, now, now the kingdom is coming. Now the kingdom is here. Is this the time you're going to restore it? So they're asking this question. And Jesus said, it is not for you to know the times or epics. You don't get to see that word very much, do you? Epics. Pretty cool. Which the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. What is Jesus telling them? He's saying, look, don't be concerned about how all this is going to work out. Just go and do what I told you to do. Just go and be my witnesses. No one knows when it's all going to come together. But live like it's today. That's what he's saying. He's like, live like it's today. Now, if we all believe that Jesus is coming back, and that it could be at any moment, how would your life be different right now? If you believe that at any moment, right now, in the uh, snap of a finger, in the blink of an eye, as the Bible tells us, that we could be, as the church, called away in the rapture. If you believe that, wouldn't your life be a little bit different? I mean, if we really believe that the kingdom of God, right, could come just like that. It goes on to say, after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them, two angels. And they also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus, and some translations say this same Jesus, and that's important, this same Jesus who has been taken up for you, uh, from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. They're standing there, and all of a sudden Jesus begins to rise up into the sky. And they're like, where, where, are you, where are you going? You just got back? And now you're leaving again? And Jesus is like, yeah, because now it's on you. You go and be my witnesses. You go and you are the light in the world. You are now my representatives. And you go and you speak on my behalf. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount which is called Olive, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. And when they had entered the city, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. So get this. They were in the upper room. We know Jesus appears to them twice in the upper room. They're there with the doors locked. Jesus is walking through walls. He's showing up and, and he's performing miracles right then and there. Just by walking through a wall, they're like, wow, you really are the Messiah. So now they go back to the upper room. Peter and John and James and Andrew and Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot and Judas the son of James. These were all with one mind, were continually devoting themselves to prayer along with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and with his brothers. And then we're going to look at this passage, Acts 2.42. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And then those of you who get some of my social media posts, the, verse for the memory verse for this past week, Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no vision, the people are unrestrained. Or some translations may say, where there is no vision, okay, the people cast off restraint. But happy is he who keeps the law. 
this morning, what is all of this about? I want to challenge you this morning to be an advancer, to be someone. And over the next few weeks, we're going to talk about this. What does it look like to advance the kingdom of God? What does it look like for our church to advance the kingdom of God? What does it look like for you as an individual to be giving yourself to advancing the kingdom of God? Because I believe that God has something, a role for each and every one of us to do here. Because of this statement right here, Revelation 7-9. You may not have known this, but God has a mission statement. God has a dream. God has a dream, and this is it, Revelation 7-9. After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. This is God's end game. This is what God is moving towards. This is what God is intending to happen and will happen at the end of time. This is what He wants us to be promoting. This is what He wants us to advance. And as a church that follows Jesus Christ, this is what we need to be about. That every tongue, every tribe, every nation will be represented before God, giving praise to Jesus Christ. Now I'm going to ask, I want to do a little quick little survey. How many of you are here today who have a different nationality? You're from another country. Okay? All right? We've got Felix over here from uh, Kenya, right? It's good to have you back today, man. Thanks for coming. Yeah, amen. Got Patrick here, Jamaica, right? Natalie from Jamaica, yeah, right? Awesome. We've got uh, Seda here from El Salvador. Woohoo! We're going there this summer, right? Who else raised their hand? Where else did I? Okay, yeah, we've got Elvia here from Colombia. Yes, awesome. Huh? Yes. Did you raise your hand, Mom? Okay, I didn't see it. So, uh, yeah. I was going to get to her. I hadn't forgotten her, but yes. So, yes. <laughs> I won't forget my mom. So, from Korea, South Korea, okay? Who else? Who else from another country? Anybody else? All right. So, you see, we've already got great representation here. But, you know, God is not content till he has someone from every tribe, every nation. And you know what? We live in a place where we've pretty much got that. We live in Atlanta. I mean, this, the busiest airport in the world. People traveling through here all the time. There's no reason why our church can't represent. Y'all want to represent? Right? I want to represent. When we get to heaven, I want God saying, man, y'all represented well. <laughs> right? Y'all had somebody. And you know what? We can do it. You can do it. But you've got to be committed to advancing the gospel. You've got to be committed to it. So what is it going to take for that to happen? Well, look at this. Where there is no vision, the people are unrestrained. It's like, what, is, what does that mean? What does that really mean? Well, let's look at the opposite of that, since it's opposite day, right? Okay? The opposite of no vision is a vision, right? The opposite of unrestrained is what? Restrained. It's self-control. When you have a vision, you practice self-control. When you have something you're living for, you know what? You build your life around it. You don't just let anything come in and, and crowd out what's most important to you. And yet, how many of us, every day, every week, we go through all this stuff and we say, oh, you know, I really wanted to be committed to church, but, you know, this came up. I really wanted to go to Wednesday night, but this came up. Oh, you know, so-and-so, this happened, and I just, I just can't make it. You see, we've got all these things that crowd in and push out the things that are most important to us. Many of you, families, you think, man, I just, just want more time with my family. But you know what? Something's going to come up. And if you don't practice some restraint, if you don't practice some control, you know what? Everybody else is going to control your life for you. The only one who wants control of your life, who deserves it, is God is the Holy Spirit. 
We need to submit ourselves to the Holy Spirit and say, God, what do you want me to do? Where do you want my time to go? Where do you want my affections to be? What is most important to you? And it's Revelation 7, 9. That's what's most important to God. But how's he going to do it? He's going to do it through his church. He's going to do it through his church. You see, when you have vision, you practice control. When you have a vision for your life, so let's do a little exercise here. Just close your eyes for a moment. And I want you to imagine. The sky's the limit. Just imagine. Where are you going to be in five years? What are you going to be doing in five years? Now work backwards. What's it going to take in this next year to help you get to where you need to be in your dream in five years. You have to start making some decisions that are going to help you get there. Now think about this with your eyes still closed. What, what do you imagine for this church? Last week we had this place filled. What would it take for us to fill it every week? Think through, what do I need to do to have this place filled every week? So God, we come before you and your word tells us in Ephesians chapter 2 that you have created us in Christ Jesus to do good works that were prepared for us before the world began. That means that you have dreams for us. And so, God, we bring our dreams to you. And we ask you, God, that our dreams would align with your dreams. That you would help us to see what it is you want us to do and what our role is in advancing the gospel. That each one of us in this room would be advancers of the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. You see, this verse goes on and says, but happy is he who keeps the law. He says, when you have a vision, you're not looking at the things you can't do and saying, oh man, you know, I just can't do that. Uh, you say, hey, I'm happy to not do it because it's getting me to the place where I want to be. It's not a problem for me to turn away from this stuff because you know what? It's not helping me. It's hurting me. And I want you to understand, if something's not helping you, it's hurting you. If something's not helping you, it's hurting you. You see, when you have a vision, oops, you make and keep commitments. And you don't do it drudging, uh, dreading it with drudgery. You don't go through every day just saying, oh man, you know, this, I just hate this, I hate this. You actually celebrate it. Because you're on your way to where you know you want to be. Isn't it a shame that so many Christians walk around with a sour face all the time? Just, I mean, just like, oh, yeah, Jesus is alive. Uh, go Easter, right? No. I mean, it's like there is something to celebrate. And we need to tell our faces. <laughs> right? You need to, I mean, look, I'm not a morning person. I'm barely a day person. Okay? But when I need to put on a face, I put one on. You know what? Because everybody else don't need to be brought down by my face. Did you know you actually use more muscles frowning than you do smiling? Quit giving your face that workout. Right? Give it a break, man. Smile a little bit, right? Because, listen, enthusiasm is contagious. Did you realize that? That if you're excited, other people will get excited. That if you're enjoying life, people are going to say, wow, why are you enjoying life so much? Tell me, how can I enjoy life like you're enjoying life? But some people are shocked when they find out that you're a follower of Jesus. That shouldn't be the case. 
People should be scratching their heads saying, I don't know how you do what you do. Look at this. Then they return to Jerusalem, and you drop on down, and it gives all the disciples' names except for uh, the one that betrayed Jesus. And then in verse number 14, it says, These all with one mind were what? Continually devoting themselves to prayer. They were continually devoting themselves because they had one mind. They were in one accord. They all had the same vision. They all knew where God wanted them. And what's interesting is that the great diaspora happened and they all kind of went different ways. But just because they went different ways didn't mean they had a different mind. Just because they all went different ways didn't mean that they had a different mindset. They had the same vision, and that was advancing the gospel of Jesus. Listen, I'm fine with this church being a transient church, with people going out, as long as you're going out, advancing the gospel. I'm fine with this place being a place where you become equipped to share the gospel. That's fine with me. But when you leave, make sure you leave to advance the gospel. Don't leave angry and upset, because that's not going to advance the gospel. Don't leave, okay, being hurt. This needs to be a place where people are healed. So if there's a problem, let me know so we can deal with it. Let each other know. That's scriptural, right? The Bible says if you've got a problem with somebody, go and talk to them. Don't talk to me. Don't talk on Facebook, right? Nobody else needs to see your junk. We don't, we don't want to see it, all right? There's enough bad news in the world. We don't just have good news. We got great news. Right? Jesus is alive. And if he's alive, he's able to bring healing. He's able to bring forgiveness. He is able to do that. But we got to let him. Right? And sometimes that means we have to be humble. We have to humble ourselves. The Bible is very clear. Humble yourself. You know why it says that? Because you don't want God to humble you. Humble yourself. Make things right with other people. Get right, okay? And he says, they all had one mind and they were continually devoting themselves, right? Look, if we're going to advance the gospel, we have to adhere to what's of inter eternal importance. There are a lot of things that you may feel like are important, but let me take us back to several sermons ago. In light of eternity, I-L-O-E, in light of eternity, what does it compare to that? We get bent out of shape about all kinds of things that just simply don't matter. In light of eternity, how does it compare? You see, we've got to be of one mind, one heart, because there's only one Lord. Listen, we are here because the first disciples were faithful to advance the gospel. That's the only reason we're here. Because they carried out the mission they advanced the gospel. They went out and they told others. They went out and they lived and they died for the cause of the gospel. They gave themselves completely to advancing the gospel. Did you realize that some of us here, let me show you this. You have, most of y'all in here have this. I think there's maybe one or two kids in here, but everybody else has one of these. This license allows me to drive anywhere I want to in the U.S. and some other places, countries too. But with one caveat, and I can't read it. <laughs> with corrective lenses. <laughs> Isn't that funny? I have to take it off to read it. <laughs> I can drive <laughs> with them on, but I can't read with them on. But you see, when I took my eyeglass test, they were like, uh, yeah, you need to wear corrective lenses. And so the only way that you're going to drive and not hurt someone else, the only way that you're really going to reach your destination safely is for you to drive with your glasses on. Now, I've tried it, driving with my glasses off. And it is a little scary. <laughs> Things are very blurry. And especially in the sun, right? It's very blurry. I remember when I first got my glasses, and I put them on, and it was like a whole new world. 
was like, whoa, what is going on, right? And I was like, I could see leaves, like individual leaves. I just thought a tree was just this green blob, right? I remember just seeing that. I was like, wow, this is amazing. Everything was so crisp and clear because I had on corrective lenses. Some of you need to get your license to drive to eternity. But I want you to know, you're not going to make it without the right lenses. Because some of us are a little bit short-sighted. You're going to fail the mission. You're going to fail the vision if you are short-sighted. If you're only looking at what you're going to get out of it right here and right now, I'm going to tell you, you're not going to make it. You're going to miss out on really what God wants, and you will not be an advancer of the gospel. Because all you're going to advance is your own career. All you're going to advance is your own finances. All you're going to advance is your own reputation. And if that's all you're concerned about, you're not going to advance this church, and you're not going to advance the kingdom of God. But, if you have a vision, you will practice restraint. If you have a vision, if you have a mission, you will not be short-sighted. You will live in light of eternity. What does it mean to do that for you? Some of it may mean I need to stop really just caring about what's going on right here on my phone. I may need to put it down so that I can pick up, put my face in the, the book that matters, right? Facebook. Face this book. All right? Okay. <laughs> All right. You can tweet about it. But, but look, seriously, when you, when you think about the time that you spend on social media compared to the time you spend in what we call life, it's really sad. And we wonder why churches are closing. And we wonder why we're not being more fruitful. And we wonder why the church is not growing. Listen, this, this is kind of crazy to think about. We don't have that many people that show up for prayer. And I know that many of you show up, you know, you, you do prayer at home and that's great. But there's also something that's important about coming together collectively and praying together. But, but think about this. What if the, church, the growth of our church has been based on just the few people that have been showing up for prayer. Last week was awesome. Last week was awesome. And I'm telling you, it was prayed over. It was prayed over heavily. But what if more people got together and said, we're going to be committed to praying. This church would be exploding by 2020 if we prayed together with one heart, one mind. And we said, you know what? It's important for me to do that. Because I want to advance, not just my walk with God, but I want to advance the kingdom of God. you got to have one heart, one mind. You see, if you're not careful, you're going to be blinded by your own desires. We will fail the vision when we're blinded by our own desires. I just want to stay in bed a little bit longer. I, want, I said that this morning. After that yard sale, that yard sale kicked my butt, Right? <laughs> Kicked a lot of our butts, but I got my 16,000 steps in yesterday <laughs> and did six miles just walking around this building. Six miles yesterday. Felt like I was in the wilderness, right? <laughs> I was like, I've seen, I seen that rug 20 times, right? <laughs> Get it out of here, right? But you know, the thing about it is this. We all have things, right, and excuses and reasons why we can't be somewhere, Sacrifice. Even though I'm the preacher and I got to be here, there are mornings I wake up and I'm like, I just want to stay here for just five more minutes. Five more minutes. Because I'm tired too, right? And I remember saying that when I was growing up. Five more minutes, just five more minutes. <laughs> Gonna miss the bus. Five more minutes, right? So maybe, maybe going to bed a little bit earlier on Saturday night can help you, can help you, right, be more involved in some things that are going on here at the church on Sunday morning. When we fail the vision, we will fail the vision when we're unwilling to dream. And I want you to know this morning that God's a dreamer. God's a dreamer. And He is dreaming about this church. He's got great plans for this church. He's got great plans for you. 
So don't be afraid to dream God's dreams for you and for this church. Don't be afraid to say, you know, God, would you really want to use me like that? Yeah. Yeah. Listen, I hardly say no to anything. I, I mean, you could ask me, you could ask me for anything. I'd probably say, yeah, go ahead and do it. You can do it. Because I believe that God gives people talents and gifts and abilities, and he's gifted you, many of you, far greater than me. And there are things that you can do that I would never be able to do. And so if God has given you a dream about something to do, I want to say this. It's not on me. It's on you. It's on you. Don't, don't blame me for something not happening at the church. Most of the, I don't even know your dreams. I don't even know how God has gifted many of you. But I want you to know this. If God has given you a talent and you don't use it, you know what happens when you don't use it? You lose it. Why do you think I'm up here doing that song this morning? Right, I'm out of shape, but I'm still going to do it because I don't want to lose it. And it's like, even if I don't do it for anybody else, you know what? I'm going to do it until I can't do it no more because I don't want to lose what God has given me. And so I want to say to you, some of you, God has gifted you. God has given you things. And you might be thinking, oh, you know, I thought that time, I thought my time was past. No, your time ain't past. You're still here. <laughs> and if you're still here, God ain't done. He's not done with you. In fact, did you know Moses didn't even start his ministry until he was 80? Who in here is over 80? We got one person in here, two people in here, over 80. Three people. Three people over 80. I want y'all to know, amen. It's awesome that y'all are here. And you know what? They are here more faithful than some of the rest of us. But they are here. But you know what that means? That means that the rest of you, no excuse. God's got something he wants to do with you. So get going. Get started. Start dreaming again. Isn't it crazy that when we're kids, you could dream and imagine all kinds of stuff. I mean, it, like, you didn't care what color you were coloring the sun. Today, the sun's going to be blue, right? Didn't matter to you. Grass is going to be brown, like always. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, it's like, you had an imagination. Where did that go? Why did it die? It's because everybody else around you was saying, no, nah, you can't. No, nah, you can't. Why well, try? But I want to tell you, that's nothing you'll ever hear from God. If God has planted that dream in you, if God has planted that seed in you, He expects you to nurture it, to grow it, and to multiply it. He is not content with a little bit of fruit. He wants mucho fruit, right? He wants a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. And so I want to encourage you to dream again. As we close today, I want to take you back. Because this week, um, starting this Wednesday night, we're going to be talking about this a little more in depth. What were they doing that caused the church to explode? They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, the breaking of bread, and to prayer. These four things. You think, you know, wow, you know, if we're going to grow our church, we've got to have this, we've got to do all this stuff. I want to tell you, no. God's going to grow His church when His people commit themselves to Him. He says, if my people who are called by my name will do what? If they will, right, humble themselves. There we are, humble, humble, humble themselves. And they will seek me. When you seek me, you will find me. How are we seeking him? Through the apostles' teaching. It's through preaching and teaching, okay? Through Bible study. Fellowship with one another. We're going to talk about that, koinonia. So it's not, it's not just a social event. It's getting together and really caring for one another. Bearing each other's burdens. That's what we're committing to. Breaking of bread in just a few moments. We're going we're gonna to share in communion. 
It's, it's evaluating each and every one of our lives and saying, God, am I where you want me to be? Am I living, as that song said, for your glory, for your glory, for your glory, and to prayer? We've got to be committed to these things. If we are committed, this church will grow. I said it before, if you care, they will come. When you care about your relationship with God, others, will they'll benefit from it because you care about your relationship with God. If you care about them, they're going to benefit from it because you care about them. You're going to benefit from it because you care. God always blesses us when we care about the things that are on His heart.